Are your coat pockets full of CDs? Good, good. Well, as I said earlier, we did the first version, the first um, run through this festival almost a year and a half ago. And it was a much sort of smaller event uh, at that time. And, um, but one of the performers uh, the first, first time around was, uh, was Tony Barrand. And we have Tony back again this year because when you have Tony in town, how can you not have him back to a traditional music festival? One of, one of our great musical treasures in town. And also, Tony is just about to receive, in the next couple of months, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Country Dance and Song Society. 40 years of singing with his partner, John Roberts. 35 years of Noel Sing We Clear, as we, more than anyone, would know here in Brattleboro. Just a, a phenomenal um, career of uh, great um, song research and singing and passing those songs on to, to people. And not to forget the dancing, that's right. Tony has also done a huge amount of work uh, um, teaching and more recently archiving videos of traditional dance. Come to Tony's Lifetime Achievement Award ceremony in, uh, in, at the end of March. It'll be a, a wonderful event. But for now, you get to enjoy Tony right here. Tony Barrand. So, um, I wanted to say when Keith was uh, naming all of that stuff that, to show what a wonderful place Brattleboro was, I wanted to add, and that's only in one block. <laughs> so, um, my dad used to do recitations at uh, church functions, and this one has a bit of a chorus that goes, um, I'll remember it when we get there. It goes, uh, I don't know, you'll, you'll pick it up. There is a chorus to it. Uh, but mostly I'm going to ask you a question and you have to answer, yes, Tony, but keep it clean. <laughs> Nell was a collier's daughter, innocent, sweet 17. Shall I tell you the story of Nellie? Yes, Tony, keep it clean. Okay. Nell was a collier's daughter, with a coal-black daddy so fine. To the theatre he'd stray at the end of the day to forget the dark toil of the mine. Once he sat in the gallery with some of the lads and they started to quarrel a bit. Though it wasn't his shift, they gave him a lift and the collier went down in the pit. And here's the chorus. Years have rolled on since it happened. Time soothed the widow's pain. Ah, but Nell fell in love with a diver. He used to dive under the ships. He'd walk on the bed of the ocean and tread on the fishes and chips. <laughs> but her mother and he could never agree. They'd quarrel for hours and hours. Once he called her a dog, so she picked up her clogs and next came a coach filled with flowers. <laughs> Years have rolled on since it happened. Time soothed the widow's pain. Ah, but Nell fell in love with a plumber. Aye, Nell was a plumber's lass. She ran like mad for to fetch her dad when she smelled an escape of gas. <laughs> he went upstairs with a lighted match singing Granny's song at twilight. They heard a crack and her dad came back through the next door neighbor's skylight. <laughs> Years have rolled on since it happened. Time soothed the widow's pain. Ah, but Nell fell in love with a baker. Aye, she married a jolly Jack Tar. She was six, he was 62 and had eyes of blue. But you know what sailors are. He had a son called John who was 21. And it's very strange to say that he fell in love with Nell's mother. And he married her right away. Now Nell is her mother's own mother, and her father becomes her own son. Her mother's first child is Nell's daughter-in-law, and her sister's a son of a gun. <laughs> Nell's mother's first cousin looks after Nell's child, and they found on the day of his birth that his uncle's stepsister is his grandmother's aunt. And I'm the biggest liar on earth. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Okay, well, um, I first came to Brattleboro uh, after meeting uh, Margaret MacArthur at the Fox Hollow Folk Festival, and I can't open it, so I'm not going to bother with it. Uh, in 1969, and um, Margaret, I, John Roberts and I were two of the strays that Margaret commonly picked up and, it, and invited to, for example, Thanksgiving and New Year at the house. So uh, we came at that time, and uh, Margaret was a great collector of songs as well as a wonderful singer. So I'm going to uh, do a couple of songs that um, were involved and were ones that Margaret collected from a man called Fred Atwood up in uh, West Dover, Vermont. And she also had a, uh, a book of songs put together by Edith Sturgis called Songs from the Hills of Vermont that she, Edith Sturgis, collected from uh, Fred Atwood's uh, father up in West Dover. And some of the same versions of the same songs, but also uh, a different range of songs that each of them had. So Keith and I have been working on uh, some of these songs, and we're going to do a couple for you if Keith would come out. And um, for the uh, first one, we're going to get uh, uh, Becky, uh, Tracy, and um, Andy Davis to come out and help us. And there they are, please. This one um, is uh, called Raspberry Lane, and it's a version of a song that exists in, uh, in uh, Britain and, and in... Uh, over here, there are a number of versions that you can hear. And where's Andy? There he is, sitting down. Thank you. And um, Fred was a little embarrassed about this song and didn't really want to sing it for Margaret because he thought it wasn't an appropriate song for a lady to hear. Um, and, uh, but her dad had sung it for Edith Sturgis just fine. And uh, nowadays, we think of it as uh, mild compared with anything you can see on television almost any hour. Um, so, Raspberry Lane has a chorus though. What's the key, please? And the chorus goes, Home, dearie, home, and home it shall be to the oak and the aloe in our own country. Try it. Home, dearie, home, and home it shall be to the oak and the aloe in our own country. Good, okay. Take it away, please. As I was walking through Raspberry Lane, I chanced for to meet with the mistress of fame. The oak and the yellow are a pretty planting tree and are now growing green in North America. Chorus, home, dearie, home, and home it shall be to the oak and the yellow in our own country. It was near midnight, what could he want more? She showed him the way to the old tavern door. He called for a candle to light him to bed, and likewise a napkin to bind about his head. Home, dearie, home, and home it shall be to the oak and the yellow in our own country. But early next morning the sailor grew bold And into her apron threw a handful of gold The gold it did glitter which dazzled her eye She said, won't you marry me? Oh no, said he, not I Home, dearie, home, and home it shall be to the oak and the yellow in our own country. So keep yourself single until the next spring to hear the lark's whistle and the nightingale sing. My ship is now waiting and in it I must go to my own dear home and the friends that I know. Home, dearie, home, and home 
it shall be to the oak and the yellow in our own Sailors who roam o'er the sea Don't wear a foreign lady But keep yourself free With your sky blue jacket And a white top falling on And range the salt seas As often I have done Home, dearie, home And home it shall be To the oak and the yellow In our own shall be to the oak and the yellow in our own country. Thank you, Becky and Andy. Um, 1981, gosh, almost 30 years ago now, um, I was editing the journal of the Country Dance and Song Society called Country Dance and Song and uh, decided to put together uh, uh, some of the songs that Margaret had collected and all of the songs from Songs from the Hills of Vermont that Edith Sturgis put together to reprint them because uh, it was long out of print. And uh, one of the songs on it was of our uh, of our own Jim Fisk, our own in the sense that his wife Lucy Moore lived here, and he was probably, he was born in Bennington, uh, made a lot of his money in uh, Boston and uh, elsewhere, and was finally uh, shot by a man called Stokes, who was one of his business partners. But he is buried up in the Prospect Hill Cemetery. If you go out of the NEYT, turn right, Go to Main Street and start walking, but don't follow Main Street. Go up South Main. You go up the hill, that's Prospect Hill, it used to be known as. I haven't heard that word, that name in a while. But what you come to at the top of the hill is a very old cemetery with all the oldest graves uh, nearest to you as you first get to the top of the hill. And then more recent ones uh, keep on going down there. And if you walk into the graveyard, if you've never seen this, you ought to go see and you walk all the way along around the back, you come to a fantastic monument uh, that was designed by Jim Fisk himself. Not, not that you can see it here, but I had a photograph taken of it, and it has four half-naked ladies on it. <laughs> Imagine that, you guys. And each of the ladies is uh, carrying a symbol of Jim Fisk's wealth. Uh, one is one is a bag of money for banking. Another has a steamboat device and so on, something for steering. But on this photograph, uh, Jim Fisk's portrait is carved on the thing. But right now it's blank. He got acid rained, and his face completely disappeared. And then somebody broke the thing it was on. So I, this photograph, 30 years ago, old Jim was uh, was actually still there. It's pretty uh, special. But this is a song, when we sang this for uh, Andy and Becky the other day, and Andy said, it sounds like a recent song. And it is, because Jim Fisk was uh, a speculator in the market. Uh, <laughs> tried, in fact, to corner the market on gold uh, until the government basically prevented him, because he was getting more than, if you like, Fort Knox. He was sort of being his own Fort Knox. Uh, made lots of money, but he uh, made one great achievement, which is after the great Chicago fire, he uh, sent a trainload of food out to Chicago, and uh, even if that was the only good thing he did in his life, he was remembered for that. And in the trial of Stokes, who had murdered him, uh, this story was brought up about what a good man Jim Fisk was, sending a trainload of food. But you'll hear uh, very familiar things going on in this song from... Uh, what should be, and what has been happening now. So, Jim Fisk. 
If you listen a while, I'll sing you a song of this glorious land of the free and the difference between the rich and the poor in a trial by jury you'll see. If you have plenty of money, you can hold up your head and walk out from your own prison door. But they'll hang you up high if you've no friend at all. Let the rich go, but hang up the poor. I think of a man now dead in his grave, a good man as ever was born. Jim Fiske was called and his money he sent to the poor and the outcast forlorn. We all know he loved both women and wine, but his heart was quite right, I am sure. He lived like a prince in his palace so fine, but he never went back on the poor. If a man was in trouble, this helped him along to drive the grim wolf from his door. He strove to do right, though he may have done wrong, but he never went back on the poor. Jim Fisk was a man, wore his heart on his sleeve, no matter what people might say. He did all his deeds, both the good and the bad, by the broad open light of the day. With his grand six in hand at the beach at Long Branch, he cut a great dash to be sure. But Chicago's great fire showed the world that Jim Fisk with his money remembered the poor. When a telegram came that the homeless that night were starving to death slow but sure, t'was the lightning express manned by noble Jim Fisk to feed all the hungry and poor. Now what do you think of the trial of that Stokes who murdered this friend of the poor? If such men get free, is there anyone safe to step from outside their own door? Is there one law for the rich and one for the poor? It seems so, at least so I say. If you hang up the poor, why hadn't the rich ought to hang up the very same way? Don't show any favor to friend or to foe, to beggar or prince at your door. The big millionaire ought to swing up also, but never go back on the poor. Don't show any favor to friend or to foe, to beggar or prince at your door. The big millionaire ought to swing up also, but never go back on the poor. Thank you very much. Tony Barron.